Today we'll be examining the reason of neglect of hearing loss within the construction industry and the impact this has on our industry. My name is Michael Harding. I am a committee member of the Irish Construction Group and on my day-to-day -day job, I'm a senior check advisor with Equans. I'm your host today with Amir in the background who will be making sure this technically runs smoothly. If you have any questions throughout the following presentation, please may I ask that you put all of these in the Q&A box below on your screen. We will ask as we will answer as many questions as we can and any unanswered questions we will answer and publish on the Irish Construction Group website. If we're going through and you'd like a question, please do up the question. And at the end, this will help us identify which questions are good and best to answer now. For your CPD, we do not provide certificates for this webinar. However, a proof of attendance for the webinar will be issued to you after the presentation. Now, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce you all to Dr. David Greenberg, a true champion within our industry on tackling hearing loss and also a driver of standards on noise control. David, over to you. Thanks so much, Mike. Hi, everyone. Absolute pleasure to be here. Really looking forward to some conversation around the reasons for the neglect of hearing uh, and noise in construction in particular. I'm going to now share my slides. Here we go. Mike, if I could just get a, a quick yes, if you can see those okay? Yeah, we can see them. Fantastic, thank you so much. So today we're gonna to be examining the reasons for the neglect of hearing loss in construction and its impact on the industry. Uh, and I'm also looking forward to be able to share some resources with, with you at the end around what you can do next in your own day-to-day -day work in terms of protecting people in your hearing conservation programs. So the scale of the issue is pretty significant. Globally, construction employs over 110 million people. And there's a whole host of data and evidence on the exposures being caused. 53% of noise exposed workers report not wearing hearing protection at all. And 16% of noise exposed tested workers have a disabling hearing impairment. Now, this is something that we're going to talk about in some detail because it's really important to understand why this is happening in order that we can reduce the risks. Now, I'm going to just illustrate this a little bit further through some of my own personal experiences. To begin, I every day travel about five or six miles from my home in London to my office in central London. I typically cycle. Now, like most places, there's a lot of modern roads. In London, you've got over 9,000 miles of modern roads. In the UK, overall, 262,000 miles of modern roads. Globally, there's 20 million miles of modern roads and motorways. And every single mile of these modern roads has been built by men and women on the ground. Now, we all know in our industry, the sort of exposures that take place across construction and in the various subdivisions of construction, whether it be highways, piling, demolition, construction, fit out, and so on. We're dealing with noise, dust, vibration, stress, heat, a whole host. And noise, as we're going to see, is really the, uh, the lesser thought of cousin to some of these other issues. And why is that? And what can we do about it? And where should it be placed in terms of prioritization? So going back to this five mile commute for a moment, as I said, I cycle. This is a photo of me, as I set off with my son on the back and cycling through London on a, on a modern road, we get to see a lot of people working in construction. And at this point, it's worth mentioning uh, that I started off life as a clinical audiologist. Um, I worked for an, as an audiologist, working with people who have already lost their hearing, doing hearing tests, fitting hearing aids, before moving into academia, where I did a PhD in auditory neuroscience, in order to understand what happens to people when they are exposed to noise, and what happens to their brain specifically when they're no longer able to hear. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. But I've become incredibly passionate about this issue over the last 20 years because I was always seeing people in a hospital or clinical setting <clears throat> when it was too late to help. Noise-induced hearing loss is completely preventable. 
and yet currently totally incurable. So back to my commute briefly. <clears throat> As I step out of my doorway onto the road, the first thing I see as I come out, and this is these are uh, from a single commute, I see this, a very common sight on most roads, a planing machine that's doing what it needs to do. It's relaying the road and you can see two gents here. Now, most companies that I go to um, in my capacity as helping out with hearing conservation and noise control have a policy uh, that says, don't walk by. Don't walk by uh, if you see something that should change. And it's a, it's a really good mindset to have. Uh, and if we all have a mindset of don't walk by, then we may be able to uh, make a change in, in some very easy, quick win. So keep that in mind, don't walk by. So this is something that you will see very commonly. It's a, it's a quick video that I'm gonna now play. So what you can see is that from about seven or eight meters away, I'm recording just from my smartphone noise level meter around 82 to 86 dB. Now for every doubling of distance, that's a halving of energy in terms of sound. So by the time you're where those two chaps are standing, number one and number two, they are well above the upper action limit in terms of the noise levels, well over 85 dB. Now, it's a bit tricky to see from this video, but the chap on the top has his ear defenders clipped off of his ears. He's sort of listening out for what's going on around. And chap number two doesn't have any hearing protection on at all. So I've stepped out of my door and I've seen two exposed workers. As I carry on with my commute, I come not very far down the road and I see this. And as I say, this is the same, uh, same day. <laughs> so different company. And what can we see here? From about six or seven meters away, I'm recording 85 to 90 decibels. And here we can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven additional people within the vicinity of the loud noise. Again, none of them wearing their hearing protection. As I carry with my commute, it's a question of how far can I get before I have to hashtag don't walk by again. And I come to another group uh, doing some noisy works. So here we have lucky number nine, 10, 11, and 12. We've now seen 12 people in under a mile all being exposed to harmful levels of noise. And it's worth mentioning that after I record, I do go and say, have you got hearing protection? Uh, and there's some very interesting responses when I ask that question. And in the next one, because unfortunately I still don't make it all the way to my office, you're actually gonna see one of those interactions. So here we have lucky number 13. And as I carry on with my commute, I almost make it to the office before I do see one last group. Standing that close, you all need hearing protection. Okay. So there we have 14, 15, 16. Now, fortunately, number 14 was the first person on this commute who was actually wearing some ear defenders. Everyone else 
uh, would not have been captured in a traditional risk assessment uh, because they were just standing way too close to the noisy works. And you will have all seen this. I see it every single day on my commute. Uh, but when we do some of the quick maths on this, we start to see and bring to life those figures of just how many people are being exposed to harmful le levels of noise. And after that one, I did finally make it to my office. What an adventure. So in just 5.7 miles of a commute, I met 16 people exposed to over 85 dB of noise, and only one of them was wearing hearing protection, but who knows what level of noise was actually getting to their ears. Now, if five miles is about 16 people exposed, that means that over 9,000 miles of road in London, you've got about 30,000 people being exposed. And in 260,000 miles of road in the UK, you've got almost 850,000 people being exposed. And globally, that means that on our road networks in the construction sector alone, of those 20 million miles, you've probably had about 63 million people exposed to noise. Wow, that is a lot of exposure. And we're gonna see why that is such an issue very shortly, but you get my point. Remember, globally construction employs over 110 million people. 53% of those report themselves not wearing hearing protection and 16% of them report having disabling hearing impairment. That is where it affects their quality of life and their ability to do day-to-day -day tasks. So what is going on? What is the problem with the existing solutions? Well, traditional hearing protection, let's start there. First of all, it's impossible for duty holders and wearers alike <clears throat> to know what protection they are providing. The single number rating or the noise reduction rating that comes on the box is a lab test. It says nothing about the real world attenuation, often called the personal attenuation rating because of head shape, facial hair. Is it on their ear? Is one on their ear? Is it wiggling out of their ear? Are there breaks in the seal and so on? <clears throat> there is no way with traditional hearing protection <clears throat> to know. Traditional hearing protection will effectively always be either over or under protecting in dynamic conditions. As you heard, the noise is constantly fluctuating between peaks and troughs of noise levels. Standard traditional passive hearing protection offers a single level of protection, which is never going to be accurate. Even if you're trying to limit it to 70 dB at the year as a minimum and 80 dB at the year as a maximum, you're always gonna be outside of that range. And importantly to understand, why do people not wear their hearing protection? I don't really blame these people for not wanting to wear their hearing protection for one simple reason. They indiscriminately block both the harmful and the important sounds. We do a lot of work with people working on highways where we will often hear people say, well, frankly, I would rather be deaf than dead. If I'm working on a, an open highway with civilian drivers, I need to have my wits about me. I need to be able to hear what's going on around me so that if there's gonna be a civilian incursion into my workspace, I hear it before it hits me. And therefore I'm not gonna wear my hearing protection. That's a very, very reasonable approach to have. But of course it means that people in very risky hazardous environments simply don't wear their protection. And there's a fantastic report from the Health and Safety Executive that examines this, and I'll give you a, a signpost at the end of this presentation to this report. It's about the real world use and performance of hearing protection, and it goes into the details of why does it not work. And that report shows 40% of PPE users, those that have the hearing protection, get no protection whatsoever, zero dB, because they're not wearing it correctly, it's up on the helmet, and so on. And those that are wearing it are not getting adequate protection. And there's a whole host of reasons for that. So really, with our current approach to hearing conservation, when it comes to hearing protection, it's simply not working. So what is the knock-on effect of this? Well, using some statistics from the UK, in the UK, we have about 2.2 million people working on a daily or weekly basis above the lower action value, 80 decibels in the UK. The lower action value is when hearing protection must be made available, risk assessments must be done, and it's not, however, a legal requirement to wear the hearing protection, but it must be made available. For 1.1 million people in the UK, they are operating on a daily or weekly basis above the upper action value. And this is where it's a legal requirement to both be in a health surveillance program, and also it's mandatory to wear hearing protection. That's a lot of people uh, in, our, in our workforce that are being exposed to hazardous levels of noise. 
about one in five of our population here in the UK, and this, rep this is representative of the world as well, have disabling hearing loss. One in five of the population. Now that's a huge number of people, and there's a, a serious issue that comes from this. It's not just a, an inability to communicate, but it results in loneliness and isolation. In the UK, 3.6 million people identify the television as their main form of social interaction, 3.6 million people. And one of the major contributors to this is their hearing loss. As time goes by and your hearing gets worse, you simply start to withdraw from your relationships. You're more likely to retire early. You're less likely to lean into your work, ultimately leading to a sedentary lifestyle that is more harmful, statistically speaking, than somebody who is a heavy smoker on your health, loneliness and isolation. And something that's only recently become very widely understood and widely communicated is the link between noise exposure, hearing loss, loneliness and isolation, and dementia. In the UK, we have 850,000 people that have dementia, and there are fantastic studies in The Lancet, for example, that show hearing loss is the number one preventable, modifiable contributor to dementia. If you got rid of all hearing loss, you'd eliminate about 10% of the cases of dementia. Now, with an aging population and people who otherwise would be retiring early, this becomes a major issue for our future. We must be maintaining the health and well-being of our workforce so that they can enjoy their retirement and not suffer from dementia. And this is a growing issue. So five reasons for the neglect of noise and hearing in construction. Number one, very simply, a lack of awareness and education. In this particular study, and as I say, you'll get the slides in the recording so you can look at these resources and share them yourselves afterwards. In this particular study, it was in the Middle East, 77% of people did not know that tinnitus is a sign of hearing damage. Now, tinnitus is that ringing in the ears. Most people have experienced it at one time or another. Sometimes some tinnitus is linked to normal hearing, but in the majority of cases, tinnitus is an early indicator of hearing damage as a result of noise exposure or possibly even autotoxic uh, substance exposure. So it's a good uh, indicator, better to avoid it altogether, but it's incredible that 77% of people didn't even know tinnitus was linked to hearing damage. Equally, I find it remarkable as a clinical audiologist <clears throat> who talks about this day in, day out, but the world is a big place, that 81% of people did not know that low or muffled voices during conversation indicates early signs of hearing damage. As your hearing deteriorates, it's actually more difficult to communicate and hear specific sounds in speech. <clears throat> and we'll talk about why that is shortly. You may often meet older people who have often underlying hearing loss saying that young people today, they mumble, they don't speak clearly. They may say things like, I can hear you're talking, I just don't know what it is you're saying. And the first time that people will complain of this sort of an issue is often when there's a lot of background noise. And this is where my PhD research came in to understand why was this? Why is it that when there are more than one speaker speaking at the same time or when you're in a busy restaurant or a bar, why does it suddenly become much more difficult to communicate? And there are some very interesting reasons why. But that's very often the first time a person, whether they realize it or not, is experiencing their hearing loss. <clears throat> And equally on lack of awareness and education, 37% of people either didn't know or didn't believe that exposure to loud sounds causes hearing damage. Now we in most societies know that things like drugs and smoking and UV radiation cause uh, damage to our health. And so we can then take our, our own approach to either protection or avoidance or whatever it might be. However, with noise exposure, we're every day bombarded with noise that's not in our control, whether that be occupational or recreational. And many people don't realize even that it causes hearing damage. Reason number two, the delayed onset of noise induced hearing loss. Now, most people think that hearing loss is an inevitability with time, with aging. Well, I'm here to tell you that is not the case. There are some fantastic studies that show that 70 year olds in isolated tribes in sub-Saharan Africa, the Maban tribe, the 70 year olds have fantastic hearing 
hearing that is exactly the same as age adjusted 20 year olds living in urban environments. So there is evidence and uh, information that tells us that going deaf and losing our hearing is not an inevitability. It's not directly linked to getting older. And actually I believe that the number one contributor to hearing loss is noise exposure of different sorts. So for, to understand why we need to do a little bit of anatomy. So you've got the outer ear, the, which is the, the bit you see on the outside, the bit of cartilage that funnels sound into the ear canal. You've got the middle ear, which has the three little bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes, which amplifies the vibrations coming in. It turns the sound energy into physical vibrations. And then you have the inner ear, which is the cochlea. And the cochlea is about the size of your small fingernail. It houses 16,000 hair cells on each side in these very nice organized rows. And these cells are what turn the physical vibrations from the sound energy into electrical energy that the auditory nerve transmits to the brain. And that is how we hear. Now, what happens when we expose these delicate cells to noise? Well, quite simply, they get damaged. It is just cellular damage. It's a mechanical process that then incorporates a chemical process that results in these cells getting killed off. And it is one of the few cells in the body that do not regenerate. So in each year, you're born with about 16,000 of these cells. And that's all you get over your lifespan. Once they are damaged, once they are gone, they are gone. Now, this means that if you're looking after them, you're going to have good hearing for most of your life. If you damage them, at an, whatever stage in your life, you're gonna lose that hearing. So the interesting thing about the delayed onset of noise induced hearing loss, up to 50% of those hair cells can be lost before it's gonna show up on a hearing test. So this is why there are some real issues with our current approach to health surveillance, our current understanding of hearing classification, which we'll talk about shortly, because that 50% loss of hair cells is what is presenting as an inability to communicate clearly, as an inability to hear speech in background noise, and also for an inability to control the risk appropriately. Because we use audiometry in our regular industrial health setting, it's not picking up a huge amount of that damage. And by the time it does show up on a traditional hearing test, it's already too late. You've got the reversible damage and it's already showing up and affecting your ability to communicate. So this chart shows that long delayed onset of hearing loss that's gonna show up in an audiogram. The green line, I'll have to assume at the moment that you're all familiar with an audiogram. I think we probably are as, as an IOSH group. Um, and if you're not, we can talk about that afterwards. The green line is what you might expect from noise exposure over one to two years, all the way down to 35 to 39 years of exposure in the black line. And you can see that there's a very specific pattern. If you're familiar with audiograms, what this is showing that it takes place over a long, long time. That person with one to two years uh, of exposure, they do have a hearing loss, but they may well be marked as having normal hearing in their day to day. But without intervening, that hearing loss is going to continue. And the easiest way to carry on doing what you're doing is be being told that everything's normal when clearly it's not. There is damage. Reason number three, stigma and fear of job loss. Now, the fact that one in five of the population have disabling hearing loss is linked to this. So many people have hearing loss, but it is an invisible disability equally with tinnitus. There are many, many people, uh, and even more in construction, who go about their day-to-day -day lives with continuous ringing tinnitus in their ears. And unfortunately, this is a, has a huge impact on a person's mental health and well-being. Imagine trying to fall asleep, and that is when your tinnitus, a screeching or a screaming or a yelling sound in your ear, just as you're trying to fall asleep. And when I was working in the clinic, in the hospital environment, Day in, day out, I would be working with people who were, this was their main issue. They might have other health issues, but if they have hearing loss and if they have tinnitus, that becomes their number one issue that they're trying to deal with. Now, we have in the UK something called the Royal National Institute for Deafness. They were previously called Action on Hearing Loss. And Action on Hearing Loss surveyed a thousand adults with deafness or hearing loss. And what they found was quite alarming. 60% of those who had not disclosed their condition said that they felt others would assume that they were not competent. 
54% had worked without disclosing their hearing loss. And 18% said they did not want to disclose their hearing loss for fear of losing their job. Now, the reality is that this is very understandable. It's because it's invisible, you can very often uh, compensate with lip reading, although the damage being done to the brain, if it's not being stimulated with the acoustic sound, it causes atrophy. And that is why there is a link to early onset dementia. So it's really important that people with hearing loss, for example, get a hearing aid. And even more important, if we can use a time machine, stop people from going deaf in the first place. And we'll talk about how we can do that. But it's also understandable why they, these people who have a hearing loss do have a fear of job loss. And it's evidence like this. Now, this chart is showing the chance of an accidental, uh, uh, accidental injuries based on hearing status. So this is showing that if a person has excellent hearing in a three month period, they have a 2.4% chance of having an accident or an injury. If a person identifies as having a lot of trouble with their hearing, the chance that they've had an accident or injury in a three month period doubles to 4.8%. Now, it's very easy to understand why this is. If you lose your ability to hear what's going on, it's much more difficult to have situational awareness, to hear somebody say, watch out in the simplest terms. Now, I want you to just think back to an earlier slide where I showed you the issues with traditional hearing protection. When we issue hearing protection to people, what are we doing? We're blocking their ability to hear. We're giving them a lot of trouble, as it were, with their hearing and inadvertently doubling their risk of having an accident at work. So there's a real problem here and it's understandable that people don't want to talk about having hearing loss and equally don't want to wear hearing protection because they would get temporarily a lot of trouble with their hearing. Reason number four, inadequacies in noise exposure assessments. Now, this is multifaceted, and I'm going to touch on some of the key issues, and there's going to be opportunity to follow up with, with on this topic. But in at a high level, noise level meters, passive ear defenders and earplugs, noise dosimetry, noise reports, and health surveillance. These are all components of a hearing conservation program, and ultimately also exposure assessments and risk assessments and so on. And each one has serious flaws. Noise level meters, they take a snapshot in time. What happens as soon as you leave this situation? Is the noise level the same? Passive ear defenders and earplugs, I've already covered those in a bit more detail, what the issues are there. Noise dosimetry, it is not representative of the person's exposure. What matters is the noise level getting to the ear canal. The distance from a shoulder or a helmet and the nature of the sound is going to have a huge difference. The noise measured at the helmet or the shoulder or the chest or wherever it might be compared to what's actually happening at the ear. It's not representative of the true risk. Noise reports. So often noise reports that I see and that, that unfortunately people are given do not have a proper action plan in them. A noise report, knowing simply how loud the noise is and who's at risk is not enough. You need to have more importantly than what is the noise level, you need to know what are you doing about it to reduce and control the risk at source, ideally. And if you are having to rely on hearing protection, what are you doing about that? It is a stopgap, it is not the solution. You are buying yourself time to solve it in a more effective way, which we'll talk about shortly. But most noise reports get produced yearly, biannually, whatever, and they get put on a shelf and that's it. And that isn't gonna help us to pre prevent people from going deaf and health surveillance. I've mentioned audiometry. Health surveillance is too late to prevent deafness. When it shows something, you've already got the issue. You've already, things haven't worked. It doesn't show you anything about how to prevent the hearing loss. It only shows how bad it already is. Now, there are solutions to all of these issues with noise exposure assessments and traditional hearing conservation programs. Uh, which is somewhat outside of the scope of this, but I will be signposting you to resources to find out more. And all of these together are time consuming, disjointed, and simply not representative of the true risks and miss the point of having an action plan to solve the problem at source. And reason number five, regulatory failures, insufficient enforcement and compliance issues. Now, these are specific to the UK, but again, it's representative worldwide. The number of inspectors that we have actually going out and enforcing and being able to 
measure, me measure and monitor compliance is decreasing. This is a, we're in an, uh, an environment of deregulation. This means that we have fewer and fewer inspections being carried out. Now, on the one hand, as an employer, that's, it's, it might feel nice. I have less you know, audits. I have less uh, reasons to be concerned. But this is very bad for our workforce because, unfortunately, if there isn't the combination of education and awareness and regulation and compliance, the standards drop. Um, when it is in a, a, a let's call it a capitalist environment, unfortunately, the priority becomes profit. And so looking after our employees becomes neglected when there isn't the right regulation and monitoring and enforcement. And we see that very starkly here that this is specific to the UK, but again, it applies globally, that the number one reason in recent years for the health and safety executive uh, investigations to not be undertaken is lack of resource, that big pink block. And that is something that is a modern issue. Now, there's a whole host of other intertwined issues that I'll touch on briefly here. Classification of hearing loss. It's recently changed, but it is not fit for purpose to give people a ranking of one, two, three or four, normal or abnormal. What matters is the functional hearing assessment. Two people with different hearing profiles, one person may be really struggling and the other person doesn't even notice. It's the functional hearing assessment that matters. It's not read or reportable. To me, it is quite frankly bonkers that we can, in most countries, make a person go deaf as a result of their work and not have to report it. It's currently not reportable if you make a person go deaf. And some, there are various excuses as to why this is the case and they are all way out of date and not inappropriate anymore. For example, it's too hard. It would be too much of a burden to do it. Well, modern assessment techniques make this not true anymore, but it's currently true that you don't need to report noise and hearing loss, even though it is possible to claim benefits, at least in the UK, for industri from industrial injuries to save on benefit for hearing loss. Compliance is woefully low, as we've seen. When you don't have the awareness and the education, you don't have the compliance and the enforcement, people unfortunately revert to old ways of doing things, and so compliance becomes woefully low. As we've seen, health surveillance, which is mandatory within regulations, is inappropriate, inappropriately applied. It's not used as intended. It has a place for diagnostics, for understanding how bad a person's hearing is, but it doesn't have a place in preventing disease, in my view. And hearing protection is rarely worn correctly, as we have seen. And in recently, as an evidence for regulatory failures, Noise was recently reclassified in the UK as a category three hazard. There's three categories, one, two, and three. Number three means that it is an invisible hazard that causes permanent physical harm. Up until quite recently, noise was incorrectly classified as a category two hazard. This means that things like fit testing for hearing protection weren't really even considered in the same way that they are for face masks and breathables. So there's been a reclassification of noise as a category three hazard, which is again, just evidence of it's we've got to keep revisiting uh, the re regulatory failures. So back to this key statistic, construction workers are 60% more likely to report hearing difficulties and 53% more likely to report experiencing tinnitus compared to non noise exposed workers. We unfortunately have an issue in construction. So what are we, what are you going to do to make a difference and prevent someone from going deaf? There's a whole host of things we can do that moves us away from these harmful effects. And a lot of it links back to tools that we already have, at least frameworks that we already have and applying new technologies. The framework that's fantastic that everyone is very aware of is the hierarchy control. The most effective way of uh, managing a risk is by eliminating a source. The least effective way of managing a risk is, P is the last line of defense, PPE. But what you have to keep in mind is if you, are, have, if you have noise, if you have to raise your voice to communicate in a, in a work environment, you have a noise issue, you must immediately get the protection onto the person. But more than that, you must make sure it's being worn correctly and that it's, it's being used appropriately. And taking data and insights from example, from smart hearing protection, hearing protection that monitors wear rates, that monitors exposure, you can get the data and the insights to link your work on the higher of controls 
to continuous improvement, for, to a, a plan, do, check, act approach. And this takes our thinking from looking at the hierarchy of controls as a sort of a, a top-down funnel that you start at the top and you work down and then your job done. No. If you get down to the bottom and you're providing PPE, all you've done is you've bought yourself more time because you're not exposing people in theory. You bought yourself more time to find more robust ways of eliminating and managing the hazard at source. And this has to become a continuous improvement cycle so that once you've got the data and the insights on, well, who's at risk, who's not wearing their hearing protection, where can I actually do something? You can then get back to the top of the hierarchy and take action. Now that's the framework for how to think about improving the, the, the situation. And smart hearing protection is a key component of that because PP is the last line of defense. So you must know that it's working correctly. And so now I wanna signpost you to some really important and new resources available for doing more on this because there's there's so much out there and it is that education and awareness piece and it's you it's you as an audience that can really make a difference so the first piece of uh, information the first resource i want to point you towards is the hearing protection fit testing introductory guidance produced by the uk hearing conservation association now if you've got a smartphone on you all you need to do is open up your camera and hover it over that QR code, and it will take you straight to this document. Now, this document is a fantastic introduction to fit testing, which is a really good solution. There's, variety, there's a whole host of different ways of doing fit testing on hearing protection, but fit testing is a good first step into the world of how to make sure that hearing protection is working. Now, the next resource I wanna point you towards, again, with your smartphone, you can just hover over that QR code and it will get you straight to the link. And I'll, of course, we can follow up on this afterwards. You'll have the recording and the slides and so on. But this is a webinar that was done by three professionals. I was just one of them. Three organizations who all specialize in different aspects of noise risk reduction, hearing protection, noise control, and health surveillance. And this webinar, is a really in-depth look at the best practice in how to do each of those three aspects. So I'd encourage you to put, bookmark it, go and take a look at it um, in your own time. Uh, and that's another great resource for you to access. The next one I wanna share with you is a peer-to-peer -peer hearing conservation WhatsApp group. There's about 60 or 70 people in this group who are all, across the world, who are all dealing with noise in their workplace. And it's a place where you can get advice, get links to other resources, uh, share what your noise challenge might be, because you can guarantee that someone else has already experienced it and probably has a really good solution. And that is across noise control, health surveillance, PPE, uh, and all industries. It's cross sector, cross industry. And as I say, it's peer to peer. It's people sharing ideas and challenges in a WhatsApp group. So. Hover over that, sign up for that WhatsApp group, and again, you'll be able to see those shared resources. The next one I wanna share with you is again from the Hearing Conservation Association, who have their second annual conference in November in Manchester in the UK. There may well be some virtual and online components to it, but this is a one day event where you can come and speak to other people and hear presentations on best practice in hearing conservation. And again, it's great to get together with people that have the same challenges so that we can get into what the solutions are. So again, that QR code will take you straight to uh, the registration page for that conference if you want to find out more or attend. This is uh, the link or the QR code that will take you straight to that health and safety executive report, the research report, because I find them very difficult to find. Uh, but this link will take you straight to this report, the real world use and performance of hearing protection, where you've, you'll learn all about the reasons why people don't wear hearing protection typically, and of course, what you can do about it. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that research report. Again, hovering with your camera over the QR code, it will take you straight to it on the Health and Safety Executive's website. And lastly, the last resource that I wanna give to you is me. What I do day in, day out, is deal with people's occupational noise and hearing related concerns. I've been working in this space for a long, long time. And if I can't help you, I'll know someone who can. And this covers everything from noise control to health surveillance, and smart hearing protection. Now this QR code will take you straight to my calendar so that you're welcome to book in 30 minutes just to have a conversation about your challenges and concerns that you have 
with noise so that I can, again, give you either some immediate quick wins of how to deal with it or point you in the direction of someone else that, that can help you further. Now, the last thing that I want to draw your attention to is the Health and Safety Executive's Regulatory Sandbox. Now, this is a really innovative scheme that the Health and Safety Executive have been running for the last few months. It's the first kind of its sort in the world where they've been exploring with industry what can change in regulation, what needs to change. And I was involved in working on this project and, and have co-authored a report that's titled A New Threshold for Reasonable Practicability in Hearing Protection Noise Control. And as I say, this is in collaboration with the Health and Safety Executive and with the construction industry. And it's a really great resource for understanding what the future looks like when it comes to reasonable practicability and managing noise in your workplace. For this one, simply drop me an email, say, I would like to have access to this and I will happily share it. So, in fact, I added in some more resources, which we'll get afterwards. HS2, a mega project in the UK, they have implemented smart hearing protection and leading indicator monitoring on their project across thousands of people. And they've published some fantastic resources, which, which we'll get afterwards. And I'd encourage you to investigate those further. That's it from me. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, very happy now to stop sharing my slides and hopefully start a conversation with Mike and hear and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. David, thank you very much. Um, as always, a fantastic presentation, my friend. And we've got a few questions to go through. Um, so I will put them past you, uh, David, uh, and we can go through them if you're happy um, okay. from there. So the first one is a question what I, I see quite a lot actually in, in the Sheck world is, is there hearing protection option for someone that wears hearing protection? or hearing aids, sorry. Hearing aids, absolutely. Um, so I actually co-authored a paper with the Health and Safety Executive and the UK Hearing Conservation Association on exactly this topic, because it is something that comes up very, very often. Because of course, if you're working with people who have been working in a noisy environment for 20 years, 30 years, they almost certainly will have hearing loss and a proportion of that population will then have hearing aids. But many people think that it's too late for me. If I've got hearing aids and I've got hearing loss and I'm working in a noisy environment, well, I'm not going to wear my hearing protection because I've already gone deaf. Unfortunately, that is a very bad miseducation and misunderstanding because your hearing can continually get worse. So it's quite an involved topic of what you do because it depends on the individual, it depends on the work environment, it depends on what, the, the, what resources are available, and it tends to be case by case but it is possible to have the right hearing protection for someone with an existing hearing loss and who's wearing hearing aids. I would say best to, to uh, you, you can search for that resource. It's, it's about the use of hearing protection with hearing aids. Um, I'm happy to share it afterwards as a, as a link or as a, an email, whatever it might be, but there are solutions to that. Um, over ears tend to be the best option, equally level dependent hearing protection because they can actually boost speech sounds. So often it's challenging to wear hearing aids with hearing protection but a key message is that even if you have a hearing aid you must still wear hearing protection if the noise level is over 85 db in the uk or 90 in, in other countries cool thanks sir, david um the next question is how often would you recommend an occupational health assessment and just to put it into a bit of a scenario currently i have a client who has annual checks but wants to move six monthly it's not a particular high risk environment in this case well, they may have some specific reasons why that is. Uh, maybe they're worried about litigation and insurance, which is a big topic in this space. Um, Noise-induced hearing loss insurance claims in the UK uh, account for more than double all of the occupational disease insurance claims combined in the top 10. It's mad how many people are claiming insurance for their hearing loss, rightfully so. You know, they've gone deaf. They should get, the, you know, they need to pay for hearing aids. They need to pay for lifelong care and support and so on. Um, but the health assessment piece, um, Going from 12 months to six months, I'd need to understand why, because uh, there may be some situations where that is appropriate. I think that you're better off trying to um, find ways of reducing the risk at source, because if you can get the noise down to below uh, 80 or 85 dB, you can reduce the need for the health surveillance because the, the risk is no longer there. So it tends to be a bit of a, uh, an afterthought, the occupational health. It's quite unusual to have to go from 12 months to six months. Um, normally you should be going in the other direction because you're reducing the risk, you know, the, 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 the lesser the risk, the less you need to do the health surveillance. 
Um, so it sounds like a unique situation. So we'd want to kind of talk to you a bit more about the, the ins and outs of why that is, because it might be appropriate. It might be appropriate. I can't say it's not, um, but it would be quite unique as to why. Well, Tom, thanks, for that, David. Next one is, um, and we get this a lot throughout, um, especially in my um, experiences when on site is, uh, what do you recommend when the response to wearing hair protection is we need to hear what's going around us? Classic, classic. Um, they're absolutely right. You know, you can't really push back on that. It is statistically and evidentially dangerous to wear passive hearing protection in many environments. Of course, if you're static on a production line, possibly, and there's no moving equipment and you're isolated, it may well be that isolating yourself from the world around you is, is fine. Um, in most cases, that is not the case. So when a person says that, the best solution, I would say, is get rid of the noise so they don't need to wear hearing protection. That's number one. Number two is level dependent hearing protection or hearing protection that has hear through so that you can actually wear hearing protection and reduce the noise in the environment to a safe level so that you can still hear what's going on around you. You maintain the situational awareness, you maintain the ability to hear. Uh, and there's various technologies that can allow that. It is not cost prohibitive. Very many people think that, well, my 10 pence or 10 euro, 10 cent uh, earplug or $20 ear cans, that's nice and cheap. And anything that's more advanced is gonna be really expensive. It is not anymore. There are so many providers of level dependent ear defenders. We at Eve do it as well, uh, but there are, it is not cost prohibitive anymore. So the pushback on what I need to hear, the, the best option is, well, I'm gonna then spend my energy and reduce the noise at source. But if you can't do that, because there's many situations, perhaps power tools, for example, you just can't get rid of the noise. You need to use hearing protection, level dependent, uh, or, or using a, a hear through type technology because then you can still hear what's going on around you. Often there's unique situations, compatibility with other pieces of PPE and so on, the specific frequencies of the noise. Again, encourage you to put in 20, 30 minutes with me. We can talk about the specifics and we can find the right solution for you. Thanks, Sir David. Um, another question. Uh, I believe you had to use a mobile phone noise meter application during the readings within your video. Um, and I suppose a lot of people are asking this as well is, um, you know, what, what software do you use? Do you use a specific app um, or what would you advise? There's some great ones out there. It would be unfair to promote one over the other. Um, depends specifically on your need, because of course, you know, that, that wasn't with a, a type one or type two microphone. It's just using the phone microphone, which for many situations is fine to know that you've got a problem, right? It's not going to be fine for submitting a report to certain trade bodies and so on, uh, but it is fine for a quick check. Have I got a problem? Uh, if it goes above 85, you've probably got a problem and you need to take action, provide the hearing protection, make it work, make sure it's working and then get more detailed into, well, what can I do to reduce the risk? Um, that one was called Decibel X. Um, there are loads of them. There's a Neosh one. Um, I like that one because you can do the videos and the photos and it's got different settings. It's very easy to use and it's perfect for a quick check. There's an even better quick check, which is... Uh, if at arm's length speaking, you need to raise your voice when you're in a, an environment, you've got a noise problem. <laughs> if you need to raise your voice to communicate, you've got a noise problem. Get the hearing protection on and identify ways of putting an action plan in place to reduce the noise at source. So the, the measuring, you know, people go a bit bonkers with measuring. It is reasonable and practicable to use automated measuring systems, right? You do need to know the level of the risk so you can prioritize, so that you can show that you've made improvements. There's a whole host of reasons why it is important to measure and monitor noise levels, but it is not the, the goal. The goal is not to measure and monitor, the goal is to reduce the risk at source. And again, depends on unique unique situation. Happy to point you in the direction of various softwares that we have. Um, afterwards, meet me, email, whatever it might be. Thanks, Ed, David. Um, another question is, uh, I remember about 10 years ago, reading an article which said normal uh, degenerative hearing levels that were previously experienced of 40 year olds was being experienced by 20 year olds. Is this true? And if it, as it is, was suggested through outside activities, such as use of earphones from one's phone, how can employers um, evidence this? Uh. Again, classic, it is true. Uh, <laughs> hearing loss is getting worse, it's getting more prevalent, getting younger and younger. The um, advancements in smartphones and hearing technology, because we like to enjoy our ears, we like to enjoy sound, of course, I do as well. I love music, I love live music events, I love listening to my kids scream in my ears. It all harms your hearing, however, and it's happening earlier and earlier as a result of technology. So there are things happening in that space to 
uh, both educate and build awareness. The World Health Organization has a safe listening campaign. There's some really fantastic things going on. It is true. What was the second part of that question? It was just talking about when we're looking at... Ah, recreational versus occupational. Yeah. This is where monitoring to protect the employer in most cases. And it does work in both ways. You know, if you're in protecting the employer by having the information on exposures and wear rates, then you can identify issues before they, you know, the leading indicators identified before it comes to disease. So that benefits the employee and the employer. But on a litigation, you know, comparing recreational exposure in your personal time, Metallica in the car versus exposure to, to noise related work, uh, you need to monitor the noise exposure at work. That, that's that's the simple one and then it's education and awareness in all sorts of facets and environments about you shouldn't expose your noise level to uh, your, your ears to noise levels in recreational that are too high um so really the, the best way there is have integrated monitoring on the hearing protection are they wearing it correctly you know that's where smart hearing protection comes in to protect the uh, the employer but give the information for the employer to then help protect the employee which is really important of course well i think as part of that question as well david was are we seeing younger people um, having more hearing loss issues than those maybe of an older generation. Are we actually seeing that across the industries, all industries in, in general? Yeah. Sadly, yes. More in developed countries where you have the prevalence of smartphones, you have the prevalence of, of personal music devices and, and players. Um, so it is getting younger and younger. And the, the, the issue here is the, the long onset. Uh, Young people, they're going deaf, but they may not really even realize it. They're losing their hearing. They're getting that hair cell damage. But it's only when they get to 20, 30, 40, where it starts to affect their quality of life. And what we're going to see in time is with an aging population who have been exposed to noise even more so than we have you know, today, um, that's going to come earlier and earlier. It's going to be a problem for employers. It's going to be a problem for individuals because then they're, they're going to have early onset dementia. You know, if, if we keep doing that, it's going to increase the number of people that get isolation and loneliness, that get hearing loss, that get tinnitus and early onset dementia. So it is a growing issue. That's why the World Health Organization is really championing um, this as an issue, because it's a global issue. This is not just for workplaces or, or, you know, the UK It is a global issue. Thanks, David. The next question is, how can we prove that um, it is the workplace that has caused this hearing loss? So I suppose to go a bit further on that question is the statistical data we get for construction in specific. How do we capture that data and how do we know that it is from their workplace that they are getting this hearing loss? Smart hearing protection. There are manual ways of doing it. You could stand there all day long and observe people working. That's not really reasonable, although there are some nice sort of machine vision camera things that can detect PPE being worn correctly or not. That's not mature enough yet, but smart PPE, PPE that is measuring exposure at the ear, measuring exposure on the outside in the environment, measuring wear rates, that is already available, right? So that is <coughs> right now the best way of doing it. That is most reasonable and practicable. And that is what's in that study that I referenced if you want early access to that. It talks through why is it reasonably practical? What is the, the case for this as, a, as opposed to doing it manually where you might be uh, looking at dosimetry, you might be looking at noise reports, you might be looking at standing there all day with a noise level meter. That's not reasonable or practicable. Having it integrated, and again, it's a it's a pro and con of technology. <clears throat> it's because of this the miniaturization of microphones and the power in in connected devices and cloud-based services that enables us to create devices that can actually do this on the fly, automated, digitally, without intervention. You get automated alerts and so on. Right now, that is the best way of, of tackling that issue. What is, what is occupational noise exposure and what is recreational? Because you're monitoring the noise and the wear rates at work. Everything else is recreational. Everything else is not the employer's responsibility. Now, of course, there is a level of responsibility around, even if they're driving, if they're on company time in, in some countries, your travel time to and from work is classed as your work day. If you are listening to loud music during that period, it is both the employee and the employer's responsibility. Now that's difficult, you know, and that's education and awareness because you're not gonna be able to give them, uh, maybe you could, but you're not gonna give them PPE in their home environment if it's on, on work time. It's difficult, but there is always a solution if you wanna speak about it. Thanks, Sir David. So another one is with teams taking over the world in meetings, is there a need to risk assess the use of headphones? It's probably come out in some of my early answers. Uh, it sounds mad, but according to regulation and the, the reality of the risks, the answer is yes. 
if you are on a meeting and the person is wearing headphones and the sound out of those headphones is over 85 dB, now I'm not giving you solutions to this right here because this is hard. <laughs> and also you've got to keep in mind that, that what is reasonable and practical, right? There's always that threshold of, well, it's just not reasonable necessarily to, for me to do it. So there's, there's a balance of risk. You know, what is the risk to the person? But there is a definite risk to the person. If they're listening all day on a Teams call to sound over 85 dB and they're not working on a construction site, but they're actually exposing themselves, that is an issue. They are going to go deaf. It is on the employer, um, amazingly, because it's a really challenging one. And it's also on the employee to not do that. It's a, it's a joint responsibility. But... Yeah, happy to talk to you about specific situations, but I don't actually know of a company um, just thinking, I don't know of anyone that's really solved that really well. It's going to become more of an issue. And I think there will be good solutions, you know, even if it's just saying, well, don't use headphones, use speakers, for example, and, you know, make sure that you're, you're not exceeding it. Um, there is also a new standard that's being published in collaboration with the World Health Organization um, around um, maximum output from speakers. Some kids' headphones already have this, where it limits the sound output from the speaker to 82, 83 dB. That's, that's a solution. So provide your employees with headphones that have a limited speaker. Talk to you about options for that, because I've actually worked on that. Um, and the other one is um, don't use, I don't want I was going to say cheap, but it's not really the right classification. Don't use non-isolating headphones. If you use headphones that um, let sound in from the environment, the classic example is you're, you're on an underground train that's really noisy. You're listening to music. What you'll do is you'll pump up your music to overcome the bleed in from the sound in the environment. So you've got, let's say, 90 dB in the environment. You're going to play your sound at your ear at 92. Now, the way to solve that is with cancelling headphones, right? So you block out the environment and then you can listen to your personal sound at a lower level, a safer level. Again, I've got recommendations on the equipment for that. David, one last question as we've got many, but like, like I said before, we will answer all questions and we will publish this on the Irish Construction website. Um, for this question, David, it's a bit of a scenario, but is there evidence that continuous noise exposure such as a petrol saw or grinding is worse than short, sharp noise exposure, such as a scaffold, scaffolders being exposed to clashing tubes, form work, form workers striking form work. There appears to be awareness over continuous noise. However, short, sharp exposure is often overlooked and could possibly be more harmful. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and th this is why traditional risk assessments are really problematic, um, because they it's very hard to get the full picture without continuous monitoring. Um, so continuous monitoring is one component of how to, to deal with this and know what your true risks are. So knowing your peak noise levels, your time weighted noise levels as well. Um, that, that this is not that difficult to solve, but it's about compliance with existing regs and doing what's right and knowing the actual issue. Uh, so there's also a genetic component to this. There's, um, there's a, an overall environmental component to this, you know, the frequency content of the sound, what equipment that they're using, all that kind of stuff. The, how often are the peaks occurring? But it, let's simplify it. It can take one instance of a loud noise to cause permanent hearing loss and tinnitus. Uh, it might have to be very loud and, and so on, but in, in military with veterans, it's very common. Gunshots, it's a classic. It could take one gunshot sound to your ear uh, and you've lost your hearing. Um, there's a lot more to be said on that, peak noise versus continuous noise. Again, happy to have a 20, 30 minute chat about that in specific, get into the detail on it. There are solutions uh, and they link to, unsurprisingly, level dependent ear defenders because they, they protect you from both the impact noise so short and sharp. And when there isn't the impact noise, you can hear everything. It's like you're not wearing any ear defenders, but you're protected. It's ready to kick in when the, the ratchet gun or whatever it is kicks in. And also it will continuously protect you because of the noise limiter um, for the continuous noise as well. So that's that's a simple solution to buy yourself time so that you can hopefully identify ways of not having those impulse noises and long-term noise. Now, power tools, how you know, there's not good solutions for eliminating power tools right now. Um, so we can talk about other control measures. David, thank you very much for answering all these questions. Um, it's been fantastic to have you on here. As always, everyone, please do stay tuned for future uh, IOSH webinars coming from. But from the Irish Construction Committee Group um, and IOSH in general, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.